January 11, 1983. On a cold winter night, Nancy Cruzan left work for the final time in her life. As she was driving home, she lost control and crashed her vehicle. Paramedics rushed to the scene and they found her lifeless with no vital signs. They were, however, able to restore her breathing and pulse, but Nancy remained in a coma for weeks. As she emerged from the coma and opened her eyes, she exhibited no signs of awareness. Doctors diagnosed her as being in a vegetative state, and eventually in a permanent vegetative state. After four long years of waiting and hoping, her parents decided to remove the feeding tube that was keeping her alive, as they did not want their daughter to live this way. A battle ensued between the hospital, the court systems, and Nancy's parents, ending with her tube being removed. After 11 days, Nancy officially passed away, eight years after her tragic accident. February 25th, 1990. A similar case occurred with Terry Shivo. Her husband wanted to remove the feeding tube after years of being in a vegetative state, but her parents refused. Once again, the situation became a hotly contested issue. Terry's husband prevailed in the end and had the feeding tube removed, 15 years after her original injury. Cases like Nancy and many others like her yield important questions like, what is death and who gets to define it? Death means many things from a religious, societal, political, and economical perspective. But how about medically? What exactly defines this guaranteed truth? Defining death isn't as straightforward as you may think. With the definition evolving over time as technology advanced, and we developed a better understanding of human physiology. In 1768, the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica defined death rather vaguely as a separation of the soul and the body, which medically is very unsatisfying and unquantifiable. It focused mostly on the religious philosophies of the time. Fast forwarding to the 20th century and we get a definition of death that is more quantifiable, with death being the absence of blood flow, breathing, and pulse among other vital functions, referred to as cardiopulmonary death. This definition was used until the 1970s, which saw the advent of more advanced resuscitation methods in the emergency rooms and ICUs across the country, such as ventilators and potent drugs that could restore heart and lung function. This required an update to the definition of death as the parameters had all changed, which culminated in the Uniform Determination of Death Act of 1981. Death was now defined by either of two things. One, irreversible stoppage of heart and lung function, or two, irreversible stoppage of all brain function, including the brainstem. To ensure flexibility with new technologies and advancements, the phrase, determination of death must be made in accordance with acceptable medical standards was also added. Now, a cardiopulmonary death needed to be irreversible, meaning the medical teams unable to revive the patient with available technology, and the concept of brain death was introduced. As a side note, people, including physicians, unfortunately will often say that the patient is only brain death, while brain death is, by definition, death. Interestingly, during brain death, the other organs may all be fully functional and well nourished with the use of supportive measures, which provides an ideal situation for organ transplantation. A declaration of brain death is grounds for transplantation if the patient and or family have agreed to it. Now that we've better defined death, you may be wondering how exactly is brain death determined? When the patient's brain function is in question, a qualified neurologist will assess the patient and look for three key things. First, the patient must be completely unresponsive with no voluntary movement at all. Second, any movements that are controlled by the brain must be totally absent. For example, a brain dead patient will not respond to or withdraw to pain. My methods are a little unorthodox, Mr. Griffin, but I think I can help. What are you doing? My job. Sometimes people fake being in a coma. But their knee-jerk reflex may be normal, as this is a movement that is controlled by the spinal cord and does not involve the brain. This shocks families of patients who have been declared dead, but exhibit these non-brain movements, called the Lazarus sign. Thirdly, and most importantly, the brainstem function is key. The brainstem regulates the bodily functions of heart rate, breathing, sleeping, and eating. Detailed tests of the brainstem reflexes will be performed, such as checking the pupillary light reflex. If the patient demonstrates any of these reflexes, brain death is no longer considered. There are some key considerations before a definite diagnosis of brain death is made. The body must be at least a warm 32.2 degrees Celsius, as the body, and specifically the brain, is better suited at surviving an injury in the cold. There have been many cases in the medical literature of a cold body appearing to be dead but coming back to life once the body is warm. Hence, emergency doctors have a rule that the body must be warm and dead. In fact, researchers at the University of Pittsburgh are attempting to replace the blood of trauma victims with liquid nitrogen to cool the body down and thus prolong the main organ's ability to survive while the surgery team repairs any damage. 
and then pump their blood back in once they are ready. In addition to being a warm body, doctors need to confirm that there are no drugs in the patient's system that depress the nervous system and make them appear to be dead. The Lazarus syndrome is where someone is pronounced dead, but for one reason or another, they awake afterwards. There have been 38 documented cases in the medical literature since 1982 of people spontaneously coming back to life after a declaration of death. It may be that during CPR, excessive pressure is built up in the chest, and the relief of this pressure causes the heart to restart in later hours. This is why it's important for doctors to be very thorough in declaring a patient dead, lest they wake up six feet under. These terms might be confusing, so let's run through an example. Let's say that you sustain a serious traumatic injury and are found unconscious without a pulse. The paramedics, once they find you, will start using CPR and other supportive measures to try to resuscitate or bring you back to life, since according to definitions 50 years ago, you are technically dead without a pulse. This attempt will continue in the emergency room with a team of doctors and medical staff who will keep trying to restart your heart and get a pulse. Mind you, there is no definite amount of required time the doctors have to keep going. Generally, 20 to 40 minutes of being pulseless leads to irreversible and devastating brain injury in a warm situation. So this is how long they will attempt to resuscitate you for. If they fail after repeated bouts of CPR and epi injections, the doctor will look at the clock, announce to the medical team, we're calling it time of death, 1535. And everyone suddenly drops what they're doing as they attempt to contact the family. If they successfully revive you, you may end up in a coma. Assuming they are able to get pulse and breathing restored, they will usually do a number of CT scans to assess damage to internal organs and send the patient to the operating room or ICU for further care. A coma is defined as being unable to follow commands, unable to speak words, and unable to open either eye. <sighs> this is great. I can finally be alone with my thoughts. Wait, I've got it. Predator versus Batman. Why has no one done this? I need a pen. Where's a pen? Oh right, I can't move. Once in a coma, there are three possibilities. One, you, the patient, will die due to unrepairable damage to internal organs, which happens approximately 50% of the time. Two, you will have recovery of consciousness with or without brain damage that leads to paralysis or speech defects. And three, which is most interesting, you may enter what is called a vegetative state, where you can open your eyes, demonstrate normal sleep and wake cycles, but have no purposeful activity hence the derogatory comparison to a vegetable. This is a state where there is severe brain damage with partial arousal but not full awareness, while a coma is the lack of wakefulness and awareness. Your chances of exiting this vegetative state drop to 1% if you remain in it for 12 months. But what is consciousness? It is defined as biological events in the deep brain structures of the thalamus and the brainstem. Vegetative states tend to involve the thalamus region of the brain, as the brainstem is still fully functional, with the patient able to breathe on their own without a ventilator, and will be fed with a feeding tube. After one month, you, the patient, are now considered in a persistent vegetative state, and after 12 months from a traumatic injury, considered in a permanent vegetative state. Doctors and family members will meet to discuss what options they have, often forming ethics committees to make a decision on whether or not to pull the plug and remove life support, which in this case involves removing the feeding tube just like in the case of Nancy Cruzan. In fact, it is estimated that there are about 30,000 people in the US living, if you want to call it that, in a coma or vegetative state. Now, here's where it gets complicated. There is a state higher than a vegetative state known as a minimally conscious state, such was the case of Terry Schiavo. She was able to smile and open her eyes on command, but maintained low levels of awareness otherwise. A giant battle ensued between her husband, who thought they should remove the feeding tube to end her suffering, and her parents, who saw their daughter opening her eyes and smiling did not want to end her life. Over the course of the next 15 years, and many court battles involving lawyers, Governor Jeb Bush, President George W. Bush, Congress, and a host of other people, eventually, they removed the feeding tube and allowed Terry to pass. The question is, if the patient could recognize the predicament they are in, would they still want to continue living this way? Some are even questioning if they can involve the minimally conscious patient themselves in such a discussion. And the bigger question, who gets to decide what to do with a patient in a minimally conscious or vegetative state? In some faiths, life is cherished at all costs and pulling the plug is out of the question, while other families will opt to end life support and end what they perceive as a state of suffering. Who would you want deciding on your life if you were in such a situation? In some places, the next of kin or closest family member will decide. But what if there is a conflict of opinion between family members? In other places, you yourself must identify a person by filling out an advanced healthcare directive form. In 42 states, the five wishes living will is used, 
where you designate what you would want to happen if you were in such a situation and identify who would you want to make decisions on your behalf. It may be time for you to think about your wishes about such situations, as I've personally seen patients of all ages in such predicaments in my years around the emergency room, with death knowing no age. Death can mean different things to different people, and the definition of death will continue to change as technology advances. Defining death, just as defining life, is a very difficult and controversial issue. Thank you for watching. What do you think about the definition of death? Drop a comment down below with your opinion and subscribe for more videos like this.